Hello. Welcome to Waterstones Liverpool. Um, please give a very warm Liverpool welcome to Lenny Taylor. It's great with audiences like this. Like I don't have to do any real introduction because <laughs> like you all know who this is and why you've come and how excited you are. So it's great. So we can really just kind of get straight on to talking about the book. Um, but for all the people who've already read it, the question that we all want to an get answered right now is when's the second one coming? Out? <laughs> I, you don't really want to know. <laughs> oh. um. Sometime next year. Sometime. Okay. okay. Um, that's the closest to a spoiler we'll try and go. Um, we'll try and keep this as uh, spoiler free as we can. Um, but yeah, so the, the book is Strange the Dreamer. Um, it's gorgeous um, in, its, in its design, which obviously is like from Hodder. Um, Lainey didn't actually design the book herself. Um, or, or did How you? dare you? Or did you? <laughs> Uh, of course, no. <laughs> but now all my books at Hodder have had the same designer, and he's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's gorgeous. But it's one of those books that is gorgeous on the outside and also gorgeous on the inside. Um, it is so beautifully written. It's very much, it's large sections of the book are set in a dreamscape, a dream world. And reading it made my own dreams feel inferior. Um, suddenly it felt like all of my dreams were really boring and, and black and white um, because the world that you've created in this, in this book is so vivid. Um, but we'll come on to that in a minute. Would you maybe like to kind of give your spoiler-free synopsis of what the book's about, for rather than me risk doing it? And if sure. you spoil it, then it's not a problem. But if I do it, they'll lynch me. So. <laughs> yeah, it's not synopsisy at all. My books tend to be really hard to describe <laughs> um, or synopsize without spoilers. So I'll say that it's about um, a war orphan and junior librarian named Laszlo Strange who's been obsessed since he was a little boy with this mythic lost city called Weep. And um, he's, he's always dreamed of going to find it and see what happened there and why it vanished, seemingly vanished from the earth. Uh, but he knows that he'll never have the resources to do that. He's just a, he's a penniless uh, orphan with no resources. It's halfway around the world. Even expeditions that go there are never heard from again. So he, he thinks that, and there's a line, uh, the dream chooses the dreamer, not the other way around. And he thinks that his dream chose poorly and that he'll never be able to honor it. But then he does get an opportunity um, to go, to, to, to travel to Weep. So it's the stories of Laszlo and Weep. And also, uh, it's about the half-human children of murdered gods. So. Yeah. Um, so if that hasn't colored colored you in tree, um, <laughs> then just take my word for it. It's a brilliant book and you'll really enjoy it. It's also a book lover's book, I think. And I think that's partly because of who Laszlo is. And he's such a great character for those of us who are obsessed with books and who live and read stories. Um, because it's very much a story about stories and the way that he loves, not because he's obsessed with wheat, but also just collecting myths and stories in general. Um, in particular, one of his physical features is his broken nose, which he got when a book of fairy tales falls on his face. <laughs> and it's like, he looks at every, all of the other characters that encounter him, think he's a bit of a thug um, because of this broken nose, and actually it's because he's a like complete bookworm. And I just <laughs> love that kind of detail. Were you sort of like Laszlo when you were writing it? Were you collecting myths and stories? Um, I've always been like that, and I have been collecting myths and stories all my life. Um, in this book, they're all just invented myths and stories, um, and I didn't do any any particular research into any real stories. Um, it's just what was already in there and sort of creating my own. But um, I didn't I didn't really realize the extent until I finished the book. I didn't realize that sort of one of the major themes is a. Uh, um, sort of fantasy readers do it better. <laughs> um, and I realized that at the end that the whole book is sort of this giant love letter to fantasy readers. Um, and that moment actually, that when his nose was broken, was like a really pivotal moment in writing the book for me because initially this book was called The Muse of Nightmares. That was sold as The Muse of Nightmares, um, as the story of Sarai. And it was, um, and I was setting out to write her story. And um, I was working on it for months trying to find my way into it in just the right way. And I had this, this uh, I guess just this, I knew that I wanted to enter the story and enter Weep through the eyes of an outsider. And I, I always knew Laszlo would be in the story, but I thought he was this outsider, this 
you know, love interest or slightly secondary character. Um, but the more I got to know him for the purpose of leading into Sarai, the more I fell in love with him. And it was at the moment that, that the book fell and broke his nose, fairy tales broke his nose, that I just knew that this was actually his story. And that chapter was called Strange the Dreamer. And it just, the whole sort of focus of the book just shifted over to him and um, stole it. And so, uh, so that was that was major. And was that also the moment where it became two books? <laughs> I'm not sure. It was around the same time yeah. um, when I just I realized that it was going to be really long if it was one book. <laughs> so it. I mean, I can imagine your conversation with your publisher. Yeah. Oh, by the way, now it's two books, and I've changed the title and <laughs> and, and uh, the main character. Yeah, I had to get you know their approval for the title because they have control over that. And at first, they were like, "No, I don't like it." No, I think it's a great time. But uh, they came around, luckily. But the second book will be called The Muse of My Ears. And there we go. We That's now know something way. about the second book. <laughs> um, great. And, I mean, because... So you collect, you've been collecting stories and, and myths and things your whole life, and obviously that kind of colours into the Daughter of Smoke and Bone series as well. You can kind of see that there. Um, were there one, any in particular, though, that you felt you were kind of being influenced by in the story? Because for me, there's, there's... I don't know, it's, it is hard to kind of put a finger on but there are like shadings of like Arabian Nights mm -hmm. that kind of stuff in, in especially yeah. in the descriptions of week but I think it's very you know magpie like in what I mm. take from this and that over the years and, it, and the same as in Daughter of Smoke and Bone there was nothing in particular that I was no specific tradition that I was drawing from and I think maybe people would find something in it and then tell me this is what you were inspired by and I go oh, yeah. you're right but um, but I think the main thing in uh, in all the Daughter of Smoke and Bone books and also my previous books um, my two, my first two books, which are fairy stories, and um, and then my my third book, which has a number of different sort of mythic traditions. Um, I love the idea that that all of these things that are myth and legend and fairy tales are based on glimpses of real things that humans have got over time. Whether it's mm. angels, you know, if if they're not actually a divine being, they happen to just be a species from another world. But if we saw them, we would we would create. A story, um, and because they're beautiful, the story would be that they are divine and they're powerful. And if we saw chimera, um, because they're monstrous, then of course they would be demons and they would be evil. And so that everything, all of our myths, <coughs> come from glimpses of something that's real. And we've just taken that and created our own story that's based on just the, the sheerly superficial aspects of, of yeah. what we've seen and created our, like our own myths around it. Like the, the mythic storytelling version of Clark's Law, which is <coughs> that any technology sufficiently advanced seems like magic. Yeah, like exactly. That, kind of, that yeah. kind of thing. Anything we can't explain becomes myth. Mm -hmm. um, what about the dream sequences then that I've already kind of uh, waxed lyrical yeah. about? <laughs> um, that dream realm. To help you with that, were you keeping like a dream diary or...? No, I never remember my dreams. No? Oh. But I want to say too that I hate dream sequences in books and movies. Um, how about you guys? I'm, that's, I'm pretty sure I've, I can't remember which author it was, but I've heard an author recently tell me or tell an audience that you get like one dream sequence <laughs> in your career. And that this book is... Uh, however, I wasn't counting, but it's it's a significant number. Yeah, of but they're not they really heard. dreams. I no. mean, um, so I was like, when I realized that the setup I created was, I mean, I, I the things that I hate about dream sequences are their abstraction and lack of um, of logic mm. and um, the arty fartiness of them. And in fact, here they're not really dreams. These people aren't being guided by their unconscious. They they're they're able to meet two minds to meet in a space that's not entirely natural. And so. It's really like a real encounter where you have control over your environment, and so it's really not. They're not. I mean, they are dream sequences, but they're not. Yeah. And so I sort of, I just avoided doing the things that bug me, and um, and hopefully that will not bug other people either. Um, <laughs> so that kind of, you've already answered my next question, which is going to be whether or not you're a lucid dreamer, because oh, that's wish. again kind of a theme. Are you? I, I'm pretty sure that at moments I've kind of gone, oh wait, this isn't right, this is a dream. But I always only ever use it to wake up. Okay. And I've, I've never had enough control where I can go, okay, no, I'm going to stay here and, and enjoy this. I always go, oh, this is a dream, I'll wake up now. How and then I wake guys? up. Have any of you control any your lucid dreams, dreams? Lucid dreamers? Yeah, yeah, yeah a few lucky. people. Yeah. I think I've heard you can kind of train yourself, but I don't know. Yeah, there are like how-to books over there, but there's how-to books on everything, and I'm a bit dubious. <laughs> and I've, I've discovered that the reason I never remember my dreams is just because of my sleep cycle. In fact, when I was finishing this book, I started waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning to write for a few hours, 
um, and uh, just to add more hours to the day. And, um, and when I would wake up at that time, I would remember my dreams. And so I thought, I should do this more often. Um, Except I don't, <laughs> because that's terrible. But you never, when you were remembering them, you didn't like write them down or keep notes or. No, I mean there have been a few things over the course of my life that that became stories or the seeds of stories. It's even possible that the muse of nightmares. I, she's been in my head for so long, I can't remember. But it's possible that she was from a dream once upon a time. I mean, it's been like twenty. Maybe years. the actual muse of nightmares <laughs> who you saw <laughs> in a dream. Yes. But yeah. Um, I mean, we so we talked about dreams and magic and, and these kind of fantasy elements that, that I think um, readers of your books might expect to find. Um, but when I was reading it, I was also struck by a much more kind of serious um, theme, which is about revenge and vengeance and cycles of violence. Was that something that you wanted to write about or was that something that just kind of evolved out of the story? I mean both. Um, when I first the initial seed of inspiration was this character of Sarai in the Muse of Nightmares. But as I tried to figure out what the conflict would be in and what the plot would be, like my mind first went, you know, my initial thought is always some something really huge and I like a you know, some epic war that spans worlds or something and I was like, No, 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 I don't want to do that again. I don't want to do that right now. I wanted to, I wanted to think of a conflict that was more intimate. And um, and so the more I thought about it, um, I mean, there's a few things that ended up being really different about this book for me than Daughter of Smoke and Bone, and also maybe more different than your maybe typical fantasy adventure uh, narrative. Um, one thing is that you often get the war, and the book ends with um, the victory, or you know, the winning the war, and the sensation, or the understanding that everybody's okay now. Yay, we won. They all lived happily ever after. Yeah, and we all know that that's not what it's like when a war ends. Um, and so I wanted to look at. This takes place, this, this starts 15 years after a conflict, and the people are very much still living with intense trauma. Um, and so I wanted to look at that, and the, the bad guys are dead. And that's, you know, I don't think that's really spoiling anything for you. I didn't want to write a book with a villain in it. I was really burnt out on villains when I started writing this. I'd read a couple of books in a row that had, like, really wicked villains in them. And I had this feeling that, that writers were having to up the ante of evil so much that there was just this gruesome place that I did not want to go. I mean, I had read a couple of villains in a row where I, I just could almost feel as author like looking at other villains and going, how can I be more evil than that? You know, like you have to do such terrible things to be evil these days. Yeah, in the old days you used to just be able to twirl in a stash, Right, you know, the good old days. Really um, and so I didn't want to do that. And I also didn't want to write an action climax um, because I, I also had had that experience of where I got to the end and it was sort of manic and endless and lots of fighting and running around and that might work in a movie but I just there was a few books where I was like oh, I don't want to have that and um, so my characters aren't fighters they don't have skills they don't solve their problems um, through fighting and um, and so it was just a different conflict um, and so I think the, the, the thing that emerged was the idea of we've got two sets of survivors and um, can there ever be reconciliation and we know in the world there are people who are we despair of, of them ever being able to forgive their enemy or, um, you know, be forgiven, and that the, the being an enemy becomes your identity. And so that was the thing that was interesting to me: the idea of is it possible to save these people, um, or will they be locked in that cycle forever? And um, and the intransigence of that, and like, what's scarier than someone who will never, ever forgive? Um, and so, yeah, that did emerge, I think, as the main theme yeah. of the book. Redemption and forgiveness. And yeah, because there are characters who you... They're, they're not... There aren't, like you said, there aren't any real villains in the book, but there are characters who kind of assume that antagonist role. Mm -hmm. There are antagonists, for and, sure. Yeah, and it, and it comes out of their kind of... Their inability to shift from this position. Yeah, and you and, can understand completely. Yeah, well, why when they you are understand the way, what they've gone through, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you have kind of characters like Laszlo, who then, who were obviously on the side of because he's the main character and we love him and the, the book and the nose. Um, <laughs> but um, but also they like the way that you craft it in, is such that he doesn't just appear right. Like there is this element to which he is actually naive in expecting that if everyone just sits down, we can sort this out and yeah. everyone will just go home happy. Yeah. And actually, and surely, yeah. I mean, and. I think you know I I understand that like why can't why can't we all just get along like 
we're on the same side here. Everyone's everyone's been a victim. Can't we just reset? And um, and he doesn't have any. He's has no. He's completely unequipped. Not being a survivor. I mean, he he was a war orphan, but he doesn't remember that war, and he doesn't. He just can't understand the depth of hatred that he's dealing with. Um, that sort of indoctrinated hatred from birth, and um, and so, I mean. That's how I feel when I look at certain conflicts around the world. Like, why can't you know? Why can't we just be more sensible? But it's, I mean, it's almost like I don't know, trying to convince my dog to behave better in public so that he can um, he can have a better life if he'll just. <laughs> what does your dog do in public? <laughs> well, it's my former dog. He's dead now. Oh. Uh, he lived a long life, but like he was just one of those dogs that you couldn't take out in public because he would attack every other dog. Um, and but he loved being out. <laughs> It's a terrible comparison, actually, <laughs> from dogs, people, you know. But you know, our dogs are our people too. Um, and but you can't. There's just there's no reason does not apply. Um, it's it's yeah. And um and that I think is that is where so much of our despair comes from with the situations in the world is that that we can't. There are minds that cannot be changed. Yeah. And that is I think the most terrifying thing to deal with. Yeah. Um, and I, so, yeah, one of that is one of the things I love about the book is that you don't shy away from this actually quite difficult topic that that is really kind of present and current to the world now and, and the world as it ever has been, to be honest. Um, and I love finding stuff like that within a fantasy book. You know, that's all. There's no scenes in this book set on Earth. Like there are no. This isn't like Lord of the Smoke and Bone, which is like a portal fantasy that goes off to other worlds but comes back. Like this is all set in this other world, and yet there's this core to it that is that is so relevant to our world now and our situation. And I love finding that in fantasy books because I hate those people who kind of dismiss fantasy as oh, it's all make believe. It's got nothing to do with now. Like why don't you read something meaningful? Yeah, no, I mean, I think fantasy is like, is one of the best ways that we have for looking at these themes because you can step out of all the things we think we know about real conflicts and look at the psychology in a, in a new way. And, um, and it's a great, I, I mean, that's really a fantasy. You have the trappings on top, you have the dragons and, and, and magic. And, um, and that is really important because we read fantasy because we are looking at the same problems we're looking at in the newspaper, only in, in fantasy we have the power to do something about them. And I think, I mean, I really think that that's something we really need. That's like, I think that it's like a, a deep human need <laughs> uh, is being met by, by that, living vicariously through that power and not feeling um, powerless and that it gives us hope or the, like it teaches us how to hope maybe when you just, if you just read the newspaper all the time, just, I mean. Yeah. Terrible. Um, okay, well, that's one side. Let's try and find something happy to talk about. <laughs> um, do you have a process for coming up with your fantasy lexicon, your kind of magical, strange, unusual words, which in this book make up the part, like some of four of the words make up the parts, mm. part one, part two, part three. Um, so words like Shretha, Thrakar, Mahal, Satez, Zayadim, Mesatim. Like, where do those words come from? They come from a lot of different places, and I, I write list lists down. In every book that I um, that I write, I end up having like this clump of notebooks at the end of it, um, and I, they're all the same kind of notebook I've been using for. I buy them in bulk <laughs> <laughs> from France, but they're not fancy. They're like because you guys know fancy notebooks that do not let you. Um, write freely in them because they're too nice and you're afraid uh, of messing I have, them up. I have a shelf of yeah. like, too nice to use notebooks. Yeah, that me too. One day I'll have an idea that's good enough to go in that notebook, but in the meantime I'll use this cheap one that yeah. I've got. Yeah. So these are perfect because they're hardcover and they have thick paper but not too thick and it's lined and it's normal paper but it doesn't bleed through. It's just they're perfect. They're good clarifying. quality but just the right size yeah. and too nice. And I'll collage the nice. covers every once in a while in the spines and I have just <laughs> dozens of them now. And um, so one of the first things I do is start making lists of words and, and names and um, just looking at them and trying to, you know, see what um, what jumps out at me and, um, and can like migrate to the, you know, the dramatis personae page or whatever, which I don't call it that because how pretentious would that be? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I look at maps is one of the things I look at. Um, okay. I'll look at maps of countries that most of my readers will probably not know anything about or, you know, not know about this village in Uzbekistan that has a cool name or whatever and um, be, be able to create 
sort of um, a cultural cohesion that way. Um, yeah, because they all have, they all kind of, and they do, they all link together. They sound like they belong to the same language. Yeah, so hopefully. We'll, I mean, I, I yeah. try, but like, you know, if a real linguist were to look at them, they'd be like, this is real whatever. <laughs> Who cares what they think? But I just, I'm, I'm looking <laughs> for the sound of it. Um, so one of the, each part starts with a, an in, invented word with an invented definition. And the second, or the first two, I think, are both Indian surnames. Um, and Sakrar is a, the last name of a friend of mine, and I asked permission to. It's a nice definition um, that if I could use her surname for this, if it was a horrible definition, I probably wouldn't use it. But also, there's a character in here named Drave, and there's a real Drave, and um, he's also in the uh, he's in another fantasy book. Did you know what it was? No, I did because you say in the, in yeah. the like afterward points to anyone who knows anybody, what the other book is, and I didn't. Has anybody ever heard of another Drave in a recent fantasy book? Well, it was science fiction actually. But it was in um, Long Trip to a Small... Long, long Trip to a Small Library Planet. Yeah, I love time. that book. Yeah. Becky Chambers. So um, he's, he's only mentioned it a couple times, but uh, he baited the book for her. So uh, there's a drive in there too. But I, and he's not like good or bad, but he lives in Portland where I live and um, okay. comes to all the, the SFF book events. And he's, he's great. And um, I was like, I'm really sorry. I didn't know the character was going to be this despicable. I said, like, oh, maybe I should change it. But he was fine with it. So. Uh, I'm, now, I'm, just, I'm now like running through Long Way to the Small Angry Planet in my head. Kind of he was like crazy. somebody that helped oh, them out the, something. I on like the remember. junk planet. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think I remember. <laughs> okay. Um, that really has thrown me because now I'm thinking about all that stuff. Um, okay, so yeah, we, it's this book, it's got its own language and its own lexicon. Um, it's not related to, to Earth um, in the ways of like portal fantasy. You said actually that you take names and, and some of your language words from maps. Have you ever, were you tempted to like create a map for this? Do you have a map, a personal one that we don't I, get to see? I or? didn't make one and I do love maps and fantasy books. We never really talked about making one for this, but um, one, one of my books, um, well, two of my books, I guess, have maps. One of the Days of Blood and Starlight has one and one of my fairy books has one. Um, but we, I didn't think it was really necessary. Um, there's sort of one journey across the world and it would have been, I guess it would have been fun to have, but... So you didn't yeah. have one for yourself, for personal reference of, of a week or anything like that? No. Yeah. No? Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I would get lost in something like that. That's what I used to do when I was, when I was a young writer. What I called writing was actually pure world Putting building. Off writing. Yeah, yeah, I was like, um, I would make maps and I would label everything like the witch's cottage in the forest. Yeah. And I would come up with all the characters and their powers and all the gods and I never wrote any stories set in those worlds. Okay. I did, it was all world building. Yeah, I, I actually did, did, I mean, I still haven't written anything, but I did the same thing. I blame it on Tolkien, because I was obsessed with the appendices at the end of Lord of the Rings. So I would set about writing the appendices first, and I'd end up with these encyclopedias of worlds that never existed. Yeah. And it, it was an I, I met a guy at a cocktail party once in Portland. It wasn't a cocktail party, it was a beer among the chicken coops party, but never cocktail mind. Party sounds, uh, <laughs> it was much more Portland than that. Um, and he said, oh, I'm a writer too. Um, and as the conversation developed, it became clear that he'd been working on two separate fantasy trilogies since the 1970s, and all he had done basically was the appendices. So, yeah, world building. <laughs> uh, which, you know, is, is something that is not writing, but I can understand the impulse to do it. Well, isn't there, there's like an, encyc there's an encyclopedia of I can't remember the name. Um, Jonathan might remember, but someone there's probably some people here who've heard of it. It's an encyclopedia, a codex for a a world that doesn't exist, written in a language that no one can understand. That's the one. What's it called? Codex Seraphinianus. Codex Seraphinianus. Yeah, it's it's an utterly bizarre artifact. Like it's an amazing thing, but it's yeah. Um, so maybe one day. Those sort of me and, and your cocktail friend will uh, publish her <laughs> works and they'll be that kind of thing. I don't know. Um, last question on world building. What, at what point had, did you decide, I'm drinking, I don't think this will be a spoiler. At what point did you decide that the people who represent like the normal people, the humans of this world, were not actually going to be normal people who are humans? That they have two hearts. Oh, yeah. That was like... Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, um, well, they're all time <laughs> So, so, it, so there's alchemy in this book, and um, and I spent a lot of time trying to research alchemy and make it make sense to myself in order to create my own version of alchemy for the book. But you can't make alchemy make sense to yourself because it's complete nonsense. Yeah. Um, and the more of it you read, the more like 
lost you become. <laughs> and um, so, but I was just trying to get enough of a feel for it to create my version. And, and you know, of course, in our world, alchemy doesn't work. But in this world, I did want it to be possible. I mean, I really struggled for a long time as a character who's an alchemist, and I. I was like, should he actually succeed in making gold, or should he have some other um, triumph that would get him invited on this expedition? Um, and I decided, no, I really do want him to make gold, and so I had to create a system that was different. And I also just, I wanted to have a few things that made it clear from the beginning that we were in a secondary world, and that there's just a few differences without having to get really encyclopedic. Or um, And there's a few things, like right off the bat, you see that the lighting in this library there are these luminous, oh, yeah. quarried luminous stones called glades, and just as soon as you see that, you realize that not this in is Kansas not, anymore. yeah, this yeah. isn't Earth, but you don't have to dwell on it. And the other thing is, you find out really within the first few pages that they have this second heart that um, pumps a, a clear fluid, and they don't really know what it's for. Um, you can live without it, but uh, not very well. And so, just to make them distinct from, you yeah. know. This, this isn't just another earth or whatever. Yeah. And I just I like the idea of it. I don't know why it just kind of got stuck in my mind and I was like, can I use that? And then it clicked into place as a plot device. So Yeah, again it was just one of those little moments that came up and I was like, okay, that's weird, but <laughs> fine. Yeah. And then it, it all kind of as you say clicked into place and made sense. So through the whole book I had to use hearts in plural. Like and you, you don't realize how many times you use heart until you do until a control you, F. So. Yeah, <laughs> um, and it, even toward in the like very last draft, people were still catching places where it accidentally had singular heart. You know. Yeah, because even like metaphorically, they wouldn't have that as a oh my heart goes out to you. Because, right, be my heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, okay, I have a couple of slightly more frivolous questions. Then one that will probably be wanting an answer from someone in the audience that I'm anticipating, and then I'll throw it out to you guys. So frivolous question number one, do you have a phobia of gates with spikes on? <laughs> because both this and Daughter of Smoke and Bone, which I only realized as I was flipping through it earlier on, begin with someone dying and being impaled on a gate. Daughter of Smoke and Bone is only a passing reference. It's in the in Prague that you reference a some resistance fighters, Czech resistance fighters, who oh are God, punished I by the gate. <laughs> I was like, this is, I was like, this, this is too. See the things I learned about myself. Yeah. I completely I like, forgot too about niche that. To be a deliberate reference. I was like, what's he reference. talking about? <laughs> I didn't do that, oh, right? So I think you might have a like subconscious fear of gates with spikes. You know, there's actually them. also um, a line in Daughter Smoke and Bone about the spires of the city, sort of ready to impale fallen angels. There you go. So at some point, you. Have, you know what it was? Yeah. It's um, what's the Hitchcock movie where the little brother gets. Impaled on a gate. Oh, I don't know. You guys know what I'm talking about? I don't remember, but there is, and it's well, I've just spoiled it for you. If you ever yeah. see it, <laughs> yeah, it's that one because I think it's like the the psychological build up. This character's obviously <coughs> effed up, and you don't know why until you find out at the end that he like slid down the the you know stair um, uh, whatever the marble stair slat thing and kicked his little brother off of it and <laughs> impaled him on a gate. So. <laughs> well, don't see, that's where that came from. So I'm haunted by Hitchcock. Yeah. Well, he just discovered it. I mean, definitely. Like I, when I was reading it, I was like, oh god, it's like that episode of Casualty I watched when I was ten years old, where that that happened to someone. Um, Hitchcock so, yeah, is cooler. I, I just, yeah, very much, very much. Um, so yeah, it was just a weird thing that I was like, is this like really? a, a, a phobia you know you have and you write into it, or have now I just discovered I something? There you go. Um, what was my other frivolous question? I don't remember what it was, so I'll leave it and move on to the one that people might want to know. Um, oh, no, I have two. Will you be going back to the world of Daughter of Smoke and Bone once, this, once you've tidied up Strange the Dreamer and, and put away these stories? Um, well, I have a couple of other books after the sequel. Um, one's an adult book, and then one is um, part of my current contract with my publisher, and that's... Um, it's a book I pitched to them when I pitched this one, and it's science fiction, and it's historical, and it's set in Civil War era New York City, and um, I tried to write it before this one, and I, I spent like four months doing research and got completely like lost and forgot what I was, what the story was supposed to be about, and research is very daunting, um, especially when it's like a really well-known mm -hmm. period like that, so um, I'll need to find a way that I can write that book, and then, I mean, I would love to get back to... I, I, I didn't realize when I was writing Dreams of Gods and Monsters, like it wasn't, I didn't intend to set up another story in that book. Um, 
but a lot of things happened as I was writing it that, like the character of Eliza was not even planned to be in that book. And then when she did come into it, she was just a human through which to get the human perspective of what was happening. And then that evolved. And this whole, the whole thing with the, the darkness and the, the Nithalam and all of that, that sort of came in and developed. I was, and I just went with it and really realized as I finished the book that... Yeah, unfinished business. Yeah. yeah, so I would love to write that book. Um, I think it's really daunting. It would be very big. And so, you know, after I finish these next few, I'll definitely, you know, see how things stand and if it's growing in the back of my mind and if people want it. Lurking. <laughs> um, have you read, this is, this is not one of the questions, um, have you read George Saunders' new novel? No, have That's, you? Yeah, it's really good. It's for just your Civil War okay. stuff and as a fantasy, it's about ghosts and Abraham Lincoln's dead son. Okay. It's amazing. It's All right. Nice book. Um, so I have to keep an eye out for that one. All right, I've been um, seeing Lincoln, it Lincoln in the Bardo, yeah, really good. Um, okay, and the other question is, have you got any news on the progress of the film adaptation? Uh, yeah, no. No, um, no. So th- we spent a couple of years doing development with Universal, and it was really, it was like really fun and also really frustrating. Um, they spent like so much money on screenplays, and you would not believe what some of these screenwriters will turn in, what they'll get paid for a million dollars, and then what they'll turn in. I mean, it's shocking. <laughs> Absolutely shocking. Um, so it was hard to get a good script. I got to do a couple of drafts, and I did not get paid a million dollars. Um, and but that was it was fun to get to do that and to learn a little bit about screenwriting. Um, but then ultimately, like you know, we got up to the point of having you know presenting it, the director presenting it to the studio, and they they just it wasn't pieces didn't fall into place. Like so much has to go right. It would have been really expensive. So that didn't happen. But there, you know, there's always the possibility of it finding a new. Angle. The producer's still trying to. So the rights are still out there. So, so Universal initially had the rights, and um, they have let them go. But we still are connected to our producer. Okay. Um, if for future film, but if we decided to go to TV, we could, you know, sort of shop it around that way. Yeah. So. Netflix. Or something. Yeah. yeah. Right. So fingers crossed. Um. Okay. So I'm gonna throw it open to you guys. Um, I'm sure you've all got some questions. Um, if you are going to ask about Strange the Dreamer, in fact, if you're going to ask about anything, try to keep it kind of spoiler-free um, for the benefit of those, those wonderful people who have so much joy ahead of them in reading the book. Um, for the first time ever in a Waterstones Liverpool event, we have a wireless microphone, so I'm just going to grab that, um, <laughs> and you will be able to ask your question and actually be heard by everybody. So this is a novelty for anyone who comes to one of our events regularly. Um, I know how annoying it is to be like, I can hear the answer, but I don't know what the question was. And the answer was yes. (laughs) (laughs) So who's got a question? Someone break cover. It's always the first person Mm -hmm. is the bravest. You are the bravest. <laughs> um, I was just wondering what draws you to the settings in your books, because particularly in Daughter of Smoke and Bone, obviously it starts off in Prague, and I'm uh, just wondering if there's anything that like draws you there. Yeah, you know, I had been to Prague um, a few years earlier, before I started writing that. My husband and I, we had done a graphic novel together, and we were going to do another one, and um, it was a vampire story, and this was like... I don't know, this is like the early 2000s. It was like pre-Twilight. And I'm like, oh, this is such a good idea. Um, <laughs> so we actually went to Prague and we spent like nine days sort of like walking around the city figuring out where the vampires would live and hunt in Prague. And it was super fun. But we, then things happened and we did other books instead. And, and um, but I still had all of that, you know, sort of sitting there waiting to be used, that looking at Prague as a setting. And um, when I started, I didn't like sit down to start a book when uh, when I started, what ended up becoming a daughter of Smoke and Boat, it was just this one day of writing. I had been writing this other book, um, or trying to write this other book for like three months, and it was a total misery. I call it my ballerinas in space book. And for whatever reason, it just wasn't working out. <laughs> and um, I, I was like, I was miserable uh, with, with these flat characters that just wouldn't come alive. And so I was like, I was going to give myself one day just to write anything just for fun. And instantly this like blue haired teenage girl appeared and she's arguing with her father who's a monster and they were just like um, immediately alive and that had never really happened to me before and so it ended up becoming the story um and there was a few things like 
he was wearing a wishbone around his neck, there's teeth in the shop, and I didn't know it, why or any of this, and I started asking myself, like, why, and figuring out finally this story, and then I had, when I was like, where should it be set? Um, I was like, well, New York, I don't know, and then Prague was just perfect, because it's like, you know, it feels like a gothic fairy tale, but it's real, and real teenagers live there and go to school there, and so it was like the best of both worlds, so that's why I chose Prague. And um, then Morocco is another setting in the book, and I hadn't been there actually, but I was sort of obsessed with it. I started reading these like expat blogs that were just, it was so beautiful and, and, and interesting, and so I, um, and such a great counterpoint to Prague too, that I, I used that as a setting, and then after the book was written, um, I went there with my husband and daughter, and we traveled around and went down to the desert. And because of that trip, then that's why Days of Blood and Starlight ended up being set in a kasbah in the desert of Morocco. Like otherwise, I don't know, it would be a very different book. So that was, I mean, I love, you know, I love to travel. It's like my favorite thing. And so I would always, um, I don't know, I, I can't imagine choosing a setting that wasn't exotic or interesting or somewhere I want to go. Um, so this one would be hard to go to weep, I guess. But I wish, because I would just, you know, love the idea of being able to do that, like to go to some sort of, you know, to see something that nobody from my part of the world has ever seen, or that sort of the idea of exploration that is just impossible for us in this day and age. And um, There is that element to this book where you get this ache afterwards that it, you can't do it yourself. Like, when you're reading something like Dora and Smith and Bone, you always can kind of hope that you will step through that doorway and have that adventure. But with this, you're just like, I'm never going to see those things. And it's, yeah. it, I think it's the sign of a great fantasy novel where you really, you really wish that you could be in that world oh, yourself. Thank so. you. I know that's what I'm always shooting for. I always, my, I want, I want to read books that I want to climb inside of, and I, I hope to write books that have that effect on readers. Yeah. You know, like we were all waiting for an owl. And yeah, all that I'm kind still of waiting. Yeah. I also want to have a demon. Yes. Um, what, yeah, I know. Yeah, I've had that conversation way too many times. Like, what would your demon be? What would your demon be? I think it would be an owl. I don't know. Speaking of owls, how about you? Uh, I don't know. I, whatever I think it would be, I, it would no doubt be something more disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> same, same. So you know, I'm like, oh well. How many you know. of you guys know what your demon would be? Oh my goodness, really? We're talking about Philip Pullman in the Northern Lights. Okay. Yeah. The new no book's money. available to pre-order, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I might as well get that in there since we're when is it coming out? October. Yeah, it does. So you have a, you have some time to read the trilogy before. Another, and you another will you will know what your demon is. If you read that book. Or you'll know what you think your demon <laughs> would be. Yeah. Any other questions? As far away as possible because it's a war. <laughs> They're in the they're in the prologue. That, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Yeah. Moths. So um, this is another thing I apparently like being impaled on gates. And on the cover. In fact. Um, because moths are in my second book uh, pretty heavily, and they're a hummingbird moths and daughter of smoke and bone, and, and the moths in this are I don't know. I mean, they're really they're they're really cool. <laughs> that's why that's all I'm going to say. No, I don't know. I mean, I like that they're. They're really not that different from butterflies, and yet they have this bad reputation, right? They're like, ew, gross, mom. Butterflies of the night. Yeah, <laughs> and they're incredibly beautiful and varied, and um, they don't get like any nobody cuts them any slack. They're, yeah. Champion uh, of They do have this this dark sort of sinister quality, but that is mostly undeserved, I guess. Um, they're just cool looking, and they're beautiful, and they're. They look furry and they have these incredible, um, you know, antennae that look like feathers and I don't know, they're awesome. And yet, most people think they're gross, so it's perfect. Yeah. I think it's because they come into your room at night and no one likes anything <laughs> being in their room at night. They eat holes in your clothes, but not all mm. moths do that. No. Fact, do you guys know a lot of moths don't even have mouths? They, they hatch out of their cocoon just long enough to mate and die. They never even eat. Seriously, like, they live for a couple of days just long enough to mate. Isn't that crazy? There's all kinds of crazy moth facts. They're fascinating. <laughs> she even has a moth tattoo on her arm right now. I mean, it, it looks like yeah, a transfer, look, but... Yeah, we'll yeah. have these uh, when at the book signing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> any other questions? Hi, uh, have you ever had to use the excuse, it's okay, I'm a writer? <laughs> oh, you mean like, hmm, I don't know if I have. But 
sometimes I, I writers joke about like their internet search histories and stuff being like, you know, what watch lists are we on? You know, <laughs> or the weird things that we research. But I don't I don't think so. I, I tend to keep it pretty low profile and do all my research sort of quietly and I don't know. Though I do when I was when my daughter was a baby, I would have to go to a cafe to write or else I wouldn't get anything done at home. And I would catch myself sometimes. You know, with my noise canceling headphones in the corner and be in the middle of writing a scene and I realized I was like making the facial expression that my character would be making. <laughs> like, you know, really trying to figure out okay, what would they be feeling right now? And I'm like, oh my god, I hope nobody's watching me. So they would have no idea what I was doing. But depending on the scene, that could be very very <laughs> strange. <laughs> well <laughs> probably was never that strange. There is a question over the further forward, then we you said you didn't take inspiration from like fairy tales. Was there any particular authors, like is it just the style of the genre that you took inspiration from? Any authors that I take inspiration from, or that you mean for this book or in general? Um, I don't know. Probably so many that I couldn't even, you know, that weren't conscious. But um, I guess this one person that always comes to mind is Angela Carter. Um, she's an amazing uh, short story writer and novelist who sadly collector of fairy tales. Well. Sadly died. Um, I don't know, something like 20 years ago, way too young. Um, but really, she did these incredible literary fairy tale adaptations. Like she did like some Little Red Riding Hood stories with werewolves that were made into a Neil Jordan film in the 80s. That's crazy. It's called The Company of Wolves. And Angela Lansbury is granny. It's so weird. You have to see it. Um, and she did this um, black bluebeard. Is it bluebeard or blackbeard? Bluebeard. bluebeard story called The Bloody Chamber. And they're so gorgeous. So she's a big inspiration. I think the Bloody Chamber is on the school syllabus here, or it was. Really? So there's probably quite a few people here nodding. There's a few people here who've been lucky enough to read Angela. Yeah, Carter. I mean, nobody in the States reads her. I mean, yeah. well, in school anyway. Uh, yeah. All only writers, I think, really know her. Um, no, that's a shame. I yeah. think we maybe, maybe I think she's more popular than she is because of the fact that people study it over here. That's but then that's also a that. double, double-edged sword because you can sometimes end up hating the writers you study. That's true. Doing it for a whole term can kill. Um, without again some nodding over there. <laughs> um, <laughs> any other questions? Yes, yeah, and then there's one over there as well. Um, with Star I have the power would be a um, mock from the dreams and the other characters having their own abilities. I'm just wondering what you want your ability to be. <laughs> this is I, yeah. So there's my my real answer and my. My, you know, <laughs> on the one hand, like Sarai, I think I would. She wished the power that she wished that she would have is the ability to fly. In her case, it was to escape. But also, flying is like all of my characters, all of my books. There's themes of flying or wanting to fly or wings, having wings. Like Karu has it. It's in all my books. But uh, if I really had <laughs> the ability to choose a gift, sadly, I think it would be to be able to stop time so that I could get more work done. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really pathetic, but it would be awesome. We'd have a lot more books. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I would have to have that caveat that um, I couldn't age while yeah. time was stopped, or else I'd be like, it's tomorrow and I'm, I'm 70. Yeah. <laughs> but look at all these books. Yeah. There was one over there. And what book, not written by you, do you wish that you could have written? <sighs> Harry Potter. <laughs> Not just because of the money. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. Actually, well, I, I, I don't know that that would be it, but Harry Potter was like a major influence for me because um, it came out just a few years out after I was out of university and I was still completely in the in, under the influence of literature. And when I tried to write in the for years after university, I, I really couldn't think of anything to write about because I was trying to, I think, you know, I thought the things you had to write about were the things that I was reading about, and it was all, you know, uh, 18th century French literature or whatever. I don't know, like, or even contemporary sort of lit literary fiction. I just, I was 21. I had like no life experience. I didn't have, a, I hadn't found my voice as a writer, and so I stopped writing because um, like I, nothing that I could write in any way approximated anything that I was reading, and um, and so I went to art school because that's a really good backup plan. <laughs> Uh, it's hard to make a living as a writer, so I think I'll go to art school. <laughs> uh, but actually, that ended up working out. But um, while I was in art school, this I remember there was this, I went to art school in San Francisco, and there was these two campuses, and we had a shuttle bus that would take us from Oakland to San Francisco across the Bay Bridge. 
um, between campuses. And I was reading the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper on the bus, and there was this review of this book. It was 1998, and the book was Harry Potter. And I was like, hmm. It was getting all this hype. So I was just curious, and I went over and bought it at this local bookstore and, and liked it, you know. Um, but it wasn't like this immediate earth-shattering thing, but like over the next few years, it just slowly opened the door to fantasy to me again. And, um, and that, and when I tried to start writing again, it was, you know, it was like, oh, I can actually write about anything. And uh, the books that I, that made me a reader and a writer to begin with were fantasy. And so it was like finding my way back. And so I'm really grateful to it for that. Um, and some of the first series that I discovered after, you know, I don't know if you, if you ever had this happen here or if you, whoever were booksellers at the time, uh, when Twilight was popular, so many people, would, so many young girls would just reread Twilight over and over, and they wouldn't like read anything else in the genre, and that would like that was always so frustrating to me. Like, there's so many other books, like read them too, and and I did actually do that, and I, I started reading other fantasy series and young adult fantasy series, and uh, the Northern Lights, which we call the Golden Compass in the states, uh, was one of them, and also the Sabrielle books by Garth Nix, and both of those have two sort of fantasy creations that I wish I had written. One is The Demons, and then Garth Nix's, um, his, his, the way that after, after world, the afterlife is, is set up in his books is like so cool and necromancy and what that means in his books. So I would, uh, yeah, I would have written those. I, I would take that. <laughs> so Harry Potter helped you kill or smother your kind of like inner... My pretentiousness? No, well, no but like, I think Having just gone through university, like you're you're taught how to like analyze texts and and I suppose maybe you've had this thing that I've, other writers have spoken about where they find themselves being a literary critic of their own work as well, they're writing it. I'm always they're... like that anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm still. I mean, that's a huge struggle for me every every time I sit down to write. But this was like. I, I just had a thought and it escaped. Um. <coughs> Harry Potter. Smothering. Smothering. <laughs> it was more like I think that uh, you know that when you're a, a young person that thinks they're a grown up, you're doing things that you think grown ups do and not doing. You know, you're trying to act like a grown up, and one of the things you think grown ups don't do is read fantasy, maybe. And so when you're actually a grown up, you don't care what you're supposed to do, and you just do what you want to do. And there's this quote by uh, I think it's, it's E. B. White. No, it's C.S. Lewis, sorry, about one day you'll be old enough to read fairy tales again. And I think that finally I came through that awkward, you know, young adult phase where I thought I had to be um, grown up. And, you know, I remember, it's sort of like, I remember once being in Italy at a cafe with uh, some, you know, interesting people that were a little older than me, and I was trying to act grown up, so I ordered a beer instead of a gelato. And then they all got gelato, and I was like, ugh. Oh. I was sorry, I didn't like beer yet, so I was like, ugh, oh, <laughs> suffering. And I was, because I was trying to like be, and they didn't care, they just wanted ice cream. So, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's like that. Yeah, um, I think China Mabel said that it's not, the question isn't why do you still read fantasy and write fantasy, the question is why did you stop reading fantasy and writing Because that's all we read as children, and you know, that is, that, those are the stories that our minds are built on. And then for some reason, some people stop, and I think those people are poorer for it. Yeah, I agree um, completely. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm reading a book right now, which is a very highly regarded, it was like something that, only thing I could find at the airport when I needed a book. And it's good, but it's one of these, you know, realistic fiction. And even though I can appreciate a lot of things about it, it's not, it's like, it meets no need in me. Like, it's, it's, um, there's books you, you read to, I guess, understand the human condition or talk about them with people at impressive parties or whatever. But, um, but I think that there are things that we need, um, and a lot of people who don't read fantasy, they maybe get them from movies and TV shows that are escapist in some way. And um, I, uh, I have a term that I come up with that I've come up with for us the for a speech recently, and it was um, that we all have a myth hole <laughs> that is seeking to be filled, which sounds really dirty. <laughs> but you know that it's not just us as children, you know, being raised reading fairy tales. It's us as human beings from the beginning of stories. Mm. The stories were epic. And they, they met a need in us, and they still do. And I think that when we deny ourselves them, I mean, I, I don't think that it's a frivolous thing. I right. think that we need to believe in, in honor, honor and heroism and true love and sacrifice and all these things that we get out of fantasy that would seem ridiculous in a contemporary mainstream book, you know? Um, possibly. I mean, maybe it could be done, but you just generally don't see that. You see, 
people, I, I don't know, trying to create real life. And I don't, I have enough of that. Like, I don't know. <laughs> That's not where I be. <laughs> okay, uh, we probably have time for maybe one more question. Two more questions? How many more questions, Sarah? One? Okay. Hi. Have you got any plans to revisit Lainey's Ladies? Will we see them in the project? No, I don't think so. Um, when uh, when I did so when I did go to art school and um, I made my living for a while as an artist and I, I had a gift product line that um, I made these ornaments that were sort of vintage inspired uh, art with quote quotes on them and I um, first I sold them like at a market and then I licensed the artwork to a manufacturer and they started being made you know in China. Um, and I was able to start writing full time when that happened, so that was great. And then after 9/11, the economy like really took a dive, and most of the stores that carried them were sort of mom and pop gift shops. Or and so as, around the same time that those started getting hit really hard, the company, you know, just this, this uh, husband and wife in the states, and uh, they, they were in a great stationery company, but they decided to retire, and I was really done. I think I'd done as much as I could, and I was starting. I had by, by that time finished my first novel, so it was like a great. Um, I mean, it made me financially independent, I guess, and not have to work uh, for anybody else for a couple of years. I was able to finish my novel, so I'll always be grateful to them. Uh, and, you know, I wish that they could still be found, that they were still made, because I do get a lot of queries, especially for some, you know, the, the books, quotes, and things like that. But, sure. yeah. But, uh, Thank you. Okay, so um, we're going to move on to the signing portion of this evening now. Um, the signing is going to be just on the other side of the coffee shop. If you just stay, well, yeah, if you just stay put a minute while I just, we get Lainey over there safely, unaccosted, <laughs> um, and then you can all come. Uh, if you haven't already got a copy of any of the books, then there is a display of them just at the top of the escalator. Um, go crazy, get them full of your friends, they'll love you forever. Um, thank you very much. Please give a very warm thank you to Lane Taylor.